Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first live stream of this new year. I think it's not quite too late to say Happy New Year, but our Christmas break is over. Uh, we're back with our regular slot at 9 till 10 on a Tuesday evening. So welcome to those of you uh, tuning in live and to those of you who will watch later. Now, what's the family party news? A few things to mention. Uh, I'm just getting over my second bout of coronavirus. It's a bit of a pain. So I was sort of in bed a few days ago, but I'm, I'm on the mend now, uh, getting there. So uh, I'll be glad when I've seen the back of that. I'll live stream next week. We have Dr. Samaroff with us. That's a great name, isn't it? That would be a, a great Bond villain uh, name. But Dr. Samaroff, you've probably seen before on the live stream if you're a regular viewer. He's a representative of the Scottish Libertarian Party. And we will talk about the issues uh, of the day. Uh, the week after that, the special guest is Mike Buchanan of Justice for Men and Boys. Now, he's written a book that argues that men in particular shouldn't get married. It says marriage is a bad deal for men. Um, so we're very much going to have a debate on that because we're obviously uh, very much on the other side of that. Um, but Mike's written a book, uh, actually, discouraging men from getting married. Um, so there'll be a lot to talk about, let's put it that way. So that will be a very interesting uh, live stream in a couple of weeks' time. Other issues that have been on my... Uh, agenda, looking around the Scottish political scene. If I hadn't been laid low by COVID, I'd have already made a couple of videos in the last week or so. But just to let you know some videos that are coming up. Uh, one is that the SNP's got a new scheme up its sleeve called the Bairns Hoos. Now, it would take a little while to explain, so I'll explain it fully in a video. But my fear is this is another push in the direction of the named person scheme. It's that sort of direction, interference in family life, sharing information between different agencies uh, unnecessarily, this, this sort of thing. So, but um, look out for that video. Uh, also, uh, an SMP MSB uh, tweeted something along the lines of sort of paedophiles being people too. And that uh, was uh, very controversial. Some people objected to it uh, very strongly. I'm going to make a video on that topic as well, um, which I would imagine some people... Uh, might disagree with that, which I'm sure people disagree with every video, some of them. But uh, yeah, that might be a bit controversial. But let's see what I've got to say about that. Right. Other big news for the family party is that our preparations for the council elections start in earnest on Friday this week. At 8 p.m., we have our first online training session for candidates and also for people who just want to explore the possibility. So if you come to that, you're not committing to being a candidate, but you, you can just hear about what's going on, find out more. If it turns out that you think being a candidate is not for you, then you've still been part of the process. You'll get to know the people and you can support other candidates. So if you're interested in coming to that meeting, we're not going to put the link just on social media. But if you are interested in coming along to that, uh, it's 8 o'clock on Friday uh, this week on Zoom. Then email chairman at scottishfamily.org, chairman at scottishfamily.org, and Michael Willis will uh, send you the link. And it would be great to see you on screen uh, for that. The council elections are a big thing for us this year. And we want to use them in order to promote the party, to raise the profile of the party, to get in the media and to meet lots of new people. And also, obviously, let's see what we can do. The electoral system is interesting in Scotland for council elections. How will it work for the Scottish Family Party? Well, there's one way to find out. So that's something we're going to be working on over the next few months. Right, on to this evening's special guest. Now, I met this evening's special guest at the uh, International Conference on Men's Issues uh, that I helped to host a couple of weeks ago now, well, just before Christmas. And it's Professor Gerard Casey from Dublin, who is a philosopher and has been has authored several books as well. So I was involved in interviewing Gerard. Now, we've had a couple of chats as well uh, online. Uh, a fascinating character, a very clear thinker, and I'm really looking forward to having a chat with him this evening about various themes. So, welcome to Gerard. Gerard, glad, glad you could join us. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm delighted to be with you. Now, I think you might be our... Are you our first ever guest from the Republic of Ireland? I think you might well be. You might well be. This might be a first for uh, the... Uh, I don't party. know. Do I need a passport to come on the programme? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> right, now, let's do... Uh, Remember? Ah, comments. I forgot to say comments. I mean, do enter comments. We'll pick up on some as we're going along. But uh, good to see some familiar names there. So hello, Mary, Lena, Alejandro, Bruce, 
then uh, uh, Bruce, yeah, looking forward to your challenging comments as usual. So fire them in and we'll pick <laughs> up on a few as we go along. Now, we've decided a few topics we're going to cover. As usual, might, we might find ourselves drifting off in other areas, but we'll, we've got a few, a, a bit of a, a skeleton uh, of issues to look at. And the thought, a good place to start in the new year, looking at the, the mainstream news, would be uh, COVID and the ongoing restrictions in, in Scotland, I don't know the situation in the Republic of Ireland. But I thought, speaking to a philosopher, you're wasting a philosopher, really, if you're getting into the nitty-gritty of the detail of the latest, you know, Nicola Sturgeon's latest announcement, which I don't even know what it was. I haven't even watched it yet. So with a, with a philosopher, let's take a step back and look at the whole issue of coronavirus and the response to it, lockdowns, public health policies, so, Gerard, what, what's your take overall on the coronavirus policy situation? Well, I mean, you mean apart from nervous exhaustion. <laughs> but, well, going way back, it seems a long time ago, I shortly, I think it was probably around March of 2020, when things uh, seemed to be sort of really serious and there was a a prospect of imminent lockdowns here in Ireland. And uh, I wrote to our Prime Minister, to the Taoiseach, and uh, I said, please do not introduce a lockdown. It's counterproductive. When you're making decisions in this area, I said it's very important to keep everything in balance, to balance the pros and the cons. And, there, and from my perspective, uh, which is basically a libertarian perspective, it means people take individual responsibility, not only individual, each single individual, but also proprietors of shops and stores, transport companies and so on can make their own policy. And then people can take, can evaluate the risk and, and so on. Um, that needless to say, <laughs> went absolutely nowhere. And then uh, we had a new government and a new Prime Minister, and I wrote to him and I said exactly the same thing and I got exactly the same response, which was to ignore it. And so what we've seen generally here, and I think the situation in Scotland is not dissimilar, was a an understandable, certainly in the beginning, response. In other words, it's, it's sort of like if you're driving at night and it's kind of foggy and something looms up in front of you, you know, your first reaction is to hit the brakes. You know, you don't even think about it. And I, I can understand that. Um, but, you know, when time goes up, you know, when it slows down, it turns out to be uh, some kind of uh, visual hallucination. Um, and you drive a bit more carefully. And, but nonetheless, you don't stop the car. You try to keep going to where you're going. So what we've seen, broadly speaking, all over the Western world is, to me, a disproportionate reaction to a real, it's not negligible, to a real threat. But it's it, it has failed to take into account almost everything else, including, and not least, by the way, the economic damage which has caused, the damage to children's education which has been caused, and, and by the way, the, the damage uh, caused by the neglect of other illnesses, cancer treatments, and, and all, you know, we, we, in other words, um, it, COVID is real, the damage it does is real, it seems to be... Uh, most dangerous to specific groups. And that was clear very early on. It, it didn't take long for that and so on. Um, it, I mean, the, the, the danger goes, woo, asymptotically goes down in, in that direction when you, as the younger you get and almost no danger at all to children. And yet we have the, the absurd situation of children in school wearing masks. Masks, by the way, which it now turns out uh, the Center for Disease Control in the USA says are practically useless. Something I've been saying, by and large, mm -hmm. uh, for for well over a year and a half. I mean, the wearing of masks is really is an obeisance to public sort of piety. Um, yeah, the, the, you want, the you want to wear a mask, you need you need to wear as a real surgical mask, and not yeah. one of the Mickey Mouse the blue things that we've all been wearing. Uh -huh. Anyway, the, 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 the teaching unions in Scotland. Well, one of the teaching unions in Scotland, which is obviously staffed by experts in this area, they're calling for uh, five-year-olds. To be vaccinated, <laughs> and, and I think I think their argument is basically because that will protect, help to protect teachers from coronavirus. So just go back to what you were saying, though. Do you think it's the case that without the restrictions that have been implemented, the health services would have been overwhelmed at any point? Um, well, if there's just, just been nothing, no measures taken at all, just let it run its course. 
Would there uh, have been people dying in hospital cough? No, no, it's, it's not a question of no measures being taken. It's a question of measures being taken by those whom they would possibly affect. Look, um, I suspect that most people would have adopted voluntarily measures close to, if not identical to, the ones that were imposed upon them um, and had been careful about distancing, as I have, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, taking the vaccines. But the the... What we've seen, however, is so. Let's take the thing about the overwhelming uh, of the the health services. This is quite this is a quite peculiar thing. Let's save the NHS, and I'm going. No, no, no. It's the NHS's job to save us. You've got it the wrong way around. Okay, it's a bit like asking civilians to save the army in time of war. It's the other way around. And the if you think uh, about the extraordinary amounts of money which have been spent, I, I, I presume the same thing is true in Scotland as it is in Ireland. In, in keeping a huge segment of the workforce in idleness for the best part of a year and a half. And you ask yourself, could you actually have built more special hospitals? In other words, uh, special ICU units, which is the really important thing, because that's where people uh, they're really seriously ill go and, and die. And um, so our numbers at the moment are something like we have, I think, 90 people in the entire country in, in intensive care. Okay, we have, I don't know, 19,000 cases a day. Well, who cares? Okay, it's just, 90, it doesn't make any difference. It's the number of people who end up in ICU. And you might have thought that some of the money that they spent, uh, our money, by the way, which we will pay for, no doubt in taxes, or in our case, probably a special COVID levy, which I can see coming down the road, uh, could have been spent, if you like, in, in bolstering the health service to take account of uh, the, the, the extra demand. As it turns out, um, the, the health service in Ireland hasn't been overwhelmed, and I can't speak for Scotland, but I suspect the situation is similar there. By the way, the, the, over, the overwhelming <laughs> of the health service isn't helped by government, by government restrictions on who can come back to work. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So when, 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 when you mandate that, that half of the people who work in your National Health Service cannot come to work, why should you be surprised when they are finding it a bit of a strain? So yeah. it's a complex yeah. situation, but I would think a lot of the problems are, again, I'm not downplaying the reality of this. I'm not one of these COVID deniers. I, you know, I mean, it, it is a disease and it does kill people. Um, but many of the problems, it seems to me, both, both medical and economic and social are caused by the efforts, no doubt well-intentioned, but, but, but incompetent to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, let me run something past you as a philosopher. This is a bit of my amateur philosophy <laughs> about the whole lockdown thing. A lot of people seem to have the, the idea that you've got to balance the harm done by the virus with the harm done by lockdowns and other restrictive measures and you, you try and come up with, with a balance so you, you you've got to make sure you're not doing more harm than good but if you're doing more good than harm overall then your policy must be right but i'm not sure about that because i think we're a, a government is responsible for the harms produced by its po deliberately produced by its policies uh more directly if you like they're more responsible for those harms them for the harms of an illness that just arrives in the country and causes harm that way. So it's not a matter of just balancing the two harms. The government is more responsible, more morally responsible for the harm done by its policies than it is by a natural agent. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's something in that? Or, or I that think there's a... quite a lot in that. In fact, I think that's very good. Well, I think that's been, been very well put. Um, it's also the issue, by the way, that we are in many cases, dealing with unknowns on both sides of the equation. Uh -huh. we, yeah. we don't know how many more people, if any, would have died apart from the restrictions. Okay, And we don't know how much less damage would have been done if the restrictions hadn't been put in place. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, assessment, even if, even if, by the way, that's taking, that's taking it for granted. But that's the, the appropriate approach. In other words, it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. and in this issue i think cost benefit analyses are not necessarily a bad thing but there's a problem here which applies to all government measures which is that they simply don't have the requisite information 
and they can't have the requisite information. It's not a matter of stupidity on their part necessarily any more than the rest of us are stupid, but it simply means they can't have the information. They can't make those decisions. It's a bit, let, let me see if I can give an example. I used to say to my students when I was teaching political philosophy, who in Ireland is responsible for the uh, growth, uh, production, distribution, and sale of food? Which government minister has that overall responsibility? And they would sort of scratch their head and go, oh, I don't know the minister for this and that. And I go, no, there is nobody. There is no government minister who has responsibility for this. And I said, isn't it interesting that supermarkets provide you go down to your local supermarket and you can get practically anything you want. And if you can't get it there, you'll get it in another one. And why is that? It's because the information is diffuse. Okay, my needs are known to me. Okay, the supermarket doesn't know my needs in particular, but by serving in the community, it has a really good idea of what people generally in my area want. And it actually undertakes to have them supplied by their suppliers, right? The government couldn't cannot micromanage that effectively. If the government was doing it, we'd all be eating cornflakes, you know, instead of porridge, you know, for 50 mm -hmm. weeks out of the 52. Yeah. It's just not possible to do it. So the problem there is that they're attempting to do something which historic, which vast experience has shown they cannot do. Mm -hmm. You just simply cannot get fine-grained enough information. And therefore, what I was proposing was that individuals and individual companies and stores and, and, and transport companies and so on, and schools, as I mean, different could differ from school to school, would make their own decisions about what they would and wouldn't do. And those who are in contact with them or associating with them would make a decision whether or not to associate with them or not, taking into account the risks and the benefits. So when you, when you do it in that way, um, you get people, in other words, people are very careful, obviously. Some people are more risk averse than others. And they therefore would, you know, stay at home and order food in. Others are less risk averse and would go out and be willing to to go in various places. Would they be able to thrust their society upon other people who were unwilling to associate with them? And the answer is no, because those people also have the same decisions to make. And so, what you would have through each individual person and group and company and and school making its own decisions you would arrive at a, a modus vivendi by which everybody if you like is is taking the amount of risk they're willing to take and would it be would it be perfect would it mean that no one would catch the disease no would it mean that no one would die no of course not but it would mean at least that the 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 whatever happened was to to the extent that it is possible in human affairs be a matter of decision for the individual that's involved and that i think is important in a free society yeah yeah no, I, I agree with that i agree i think uh, a very significant angle on the coronavirus restrictions thing i think is the psychology of uh, experts <laughs> i was hearing someone talking about it today so if you've been studying in this area about you know modeling pandemics you've been doing it your whole year and then th this is your moment i mean some people have careers in this area and they go through the whole career and it never really happens so they're just in the sidelines they're never on the telly they're never in the prime minister's office they're, they're, they're just modeling away and writing the books or whatever but these ones suddenly they're in the limelight they're in the hot seat this is their moment and i, I just feel that the psychology of that's very significant because suddenly these people have found themselves in very powerful positions. And I think that they're going to find it very difficult to just get to the point where they say, okay, that's it, it's all over. They're going back to obscurity, writing <laughs> books or whatever. I mean, there'll be preparations going on in the background or whatever. Yes. But I, I just find it hard to imagine these people ever saying, okay, that's it. Okay, it's an illness that's out there with all the other illnesses. If coronavirus deaths were put alongside other deaths every day, then they would look insignificant. Um, do you think that's that's an important point about the psychology? Well, I think it's a very experts? important point. I mean, um, first of all, uh, I, I would take issue with one of your presumptions, which is that the people who are uh, determining the policy are themselves people, necessarily people with an expertise in the modeling of uh, virus viruses. Right. Uh, in, that's not the case, for example, with our chief medical officer here in Ireland. It's not even the case with the chairman of what we call NEFIT, which is the, 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 the national, pro, I can't remember what it is for telling us what to do, who is a former colleague of mine in UCD, who is a doctor whose area of expertise is sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Well, 
um, you know, but has no, I, I hope I'm, I'm not maligning him, but as far as I know, has no experience in, in, in virology um, other than at an elementary level, no experience in statistical analysis and so on. And it's not that they haven't got some of these people, but the point is, you know, the old thing, with, to, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. so, you know, the old bureaucrat's principle is you can never go wrong by saying no. Mm. Right? If you say yes and bad yeah. things happen, then you get blamed. Yeah. So, so the tendency on the part of so-called experts is always to be, is to take the, take the, adopt the strategy of you can't be too careful. Now, the problem yeah. with that is, that you can be too careful, mm -hmm. right? And indeed, in our everyday life, we are always we are willing to accept levels of risk, uh -huh. and yeah. we could we, we cannot not do so. It's not possible to live a yeah. life completely without risk. The other thing is that we're told, well, we're all in this together, and I would say, no, 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 we're not all in this together. All of those people who are on government salaries receive, continue to receive their government salaries and their pensions, and indeed will probably get promoted and pay raises. Those who are lucky enough to work in sectors where they can work from home are okay as well. But there is a large segment of the economy, particularly in, in hospitality uh, and so on, where you can't do it virtually. You can't go to a pub, mm -hmm. you can't go online and drink a virtual pint. You've got to go to a pub in order to do that. And the effect on the hospitality industry, which in, in every country is important, but in Ireland is particularly important, has been devastating. Many people mm -hmm. would never recover. And moreover, once they start loosening up here, which they eventually will have to do, you see this, this, uh, this lockdown, uh, lockdown stop on off has simply, is simply unsustainable. Um, once they start doing that, they will discover that the effect uh, they have, will have destroyed beyond possibility of reconstruction many, many firms. And the, and the economic effect on that, and people say, well, it's only money, but hang on a second. Money means income and lives and health to real individuals. Mm -hmm. So it's not the case that everybody suffers to the same extent. I'm leaving, I'm not talking now about the people who, who die here and so on, but I'm talking about the effect that COVID has on those who don't die. Mm -hmm. And yep. that hasn't been taken into account. And you're right. Many of these people have been plucked from obscurity and are enjoying their moment in the sun and the constant attention they get and, and the reverent uh, attitude, uh, especially of news reporters, uh, which has been the only word I can describe uh, is in Ireland. I, I'm sure the same thing is probably true in Scotland, has been sycophantic in the extreme. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, at most news conferences, you get at least a semblance of tough questions, although very often not as many as you would think. But here, the, the, one of my friends who is in the business went to one of these uh, press conferences and he said it was nauseating. All that were happening is that they were simply taking down what they were being told directly from the chief medical officer and then retailing it without yeah. any questions being asked yeah. about the costs yeah. and the benefits and all of the rest of the kinds of things we're not becoming familiar with. Yeah. I think, what, I mean, you, you said about the um, our chief medical officer in Scotland, as well as, as I'm aware, is a dentist. <laughs> which I wouldn't necessarily say that's a huge problem. I think maybe a bigger problem is within the Scottish cabinet where they're making the decisions, who have they got with any sort of scientific, numerate, statistical, medical, whatever sort of background who can look into this, this sort of wealth of statistics and make some sort of independent judgment on them. Now, as far as I'm aware, within the Scottish cabinet, this may be, I've heard it suggested, even within the entire Scottish Parliament, there isn't anyone with sort of technical expertise. Hmm. There might be people who, who've been, you know, accountants or whatever. So, you know, they're, they're numerate. But, but being an accountant is very different from understanding the sort of advanced statistics that they've been presented with. So I think that's a really important issue as well, that there isn't the expertise to enable them to take an independent view of the matter. They're too vulnerable to the experts because... The, they haven't got the the understanding themselves. No, that, I mean that's entirely true. I mean, I, again, uh, our our parliament is staffed largely by um, some lawyers, uh, a lot of teachers, uh, and in some farmers and so on. And nobody there, I think, probably would, uh, apart from the um, the the what do you call it, the assistant prime minister, who is a, who is a medical doctor. 
uh, very almost nobody with any particular expertise. And so they're at the mercy of the experts they choose. And here's the other thing, okay? They only listen to selected experts. Um, one of the phrases they use, and as a philosopher, this kind of makes shivers run down my spine. They talk about listening to the science. Now, anybody who uses the phrase the science doesn't know what science is. Okay. Science isn't the body of dogma or doctrine. Science is a particular approach to the generation and testing of hypotheses. And so one of the things that they haven't done is they haven't cast, even in finding their experts, they haven't cast their nets widely enough. Okay, They want a single voice. Mm -hmm. And once they've got yeah. ones they think are sort of reasonably reliable, they've stuck with that. And the others have either being virtually silenced by being excluded from um, social media platforms or not accessed in various ways and others and, and so on. And many, of these, and, and many of these people are the kind of people you talked about at the beginning who have an expertise in virology, people of eminence in their fields, mm -hmm. uh, holding professorships in reputable universities uh, where they've been studying and publishing in these areas, you know, for 30 or 40 years. And, and, and none of their nuances you like are listened to now as i said in the beginning i can understand a panic reaction that's perfectly understandable but really almost two years into this it's time you know we got a grip on ourselves yeah but with the different scientific perspectives different projections etc i think it would have been good to set up a formal process by which experts in this area submit their predictions submit their models which are then compared to reality after a few months or whatever. And then through this competitive process, some experts are dismissed from the scene. And the ones who, who've got it right, they're the ones who are, who are left in to listen to that. I think that's what the government should have done, <laughs> is to have some sort of league table of experts and to be I say, very rigorous and clear about it, that we're, we're testing you, you're on trial, and we're going to keep the ones who get it right time and time again. But as far as I can tell, that process doesn't seem to have happened. Yeah, I think that could have been set up quite easily. <laughs> but that's my tip for the next time. The next, next pandemic. <laughs> okay, I, next I, most I, no comment. <laughs> what can I say? It's perfectly obvious. I think you're right, but there we are. What can I say? <laughs> anyway, I, I think we've had a good discussion about that issue. We don't talk about it particularly often um, on the on the live stream, or as the Scottish Family Party, we, we focus on other issues. Just to say, the Family Party's policy is very much towards getting back to normal. Okay, that's been our policy for a long time, and that's very much our uh, our policy now. We're also against any sort of uh, vaccine passports, mandates, uh, etc. That's our our line. Right, we're going to move on to another topic now. This is a topic uh, that I was delighted to find out today that uh, Gerard had been involved in this issue, because in Scotland it really does feel like the Scottish Family Party is the lone voice on this issue, and that's the issue of children's rights. Now, with children's rights, they've been debated in the Scottish Parliament. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child has been incorporated into Scots law, even though there's some legal uh, wrangling about that still ongoing at the Supreme Court, etc. Um, but basically, within the Parliament, within Scottish education, within the media, this is treated as totally uncontroversial and just as obviously a good thing that any nice, decent person would be supportive of. So I, I've... So for years, I felt like the lone voice pointing out that there's more to this than meets the eye. So I was delighted to see that Gerard had been involved in this issue as well in the Republic of Ireland. I was encouraged as well. But whenever mm. I read or see anyone else making similar points, I'm, I'm quite, it, it reassures me uh, that, that I'm, I'm sane on this issue and there are valid concerns. So Gerard, do you want to tell us about uh, how you became concerned about the issue, first of all, and, and how it developed well, actually, in the Republic of Ireland? Yeah, yeah. My my concern with related issues not specifically this one but but, but it, it is in a sense part of it uh began in the late 1980s and the 1990s when our government here was introducing various forms of sex education into schools and my <laughs> my my approach was uh, i wrote a small booklet under and i toured the country talking about it to various parents and so on was look this is not the responsibility of the schools Okay, schools are set up to do to teach 
effectively transferable skills in particular areas, uh, intellectual areas, history and geography and English language and grammar and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it's the parents' responsibility to educate their children. They may delegate that if they wish to schools, but they retain in the, in the matter of social uh, uh, education, that's a responsibility largely for the family and to some extent, if you're religious, for the churches to which you belong insofar as you delegate it to them. Um, of course, needless to say, I was characterized as regressive and wanting to shut people up and attempting to pretend that there wasn't any such thing as sex. And, and I, you know, I'm going, no, I'm not doing any of that. That's just nonsensical. I'm just talking about where the responsibility lies. And, and so I was told, well, you know, we have these expertise. And of course, they'll all be, all be, there'll be these safeguards and we won't do this and we won't do that. And so, of course, and I said, well, you know, we have a history of doing this sort of thing and eventually all the safeguards disappear, right? Mm -hmm. And now we have a bill before our parliament, which effectively says that uh, in faith schools, in, in, in religious schools with a religious ethos, the religious ethos will not be allowed to interfere with the sex education programs. That's where we've gone in 30 years. All right, now what's all that got to do with your children's rights? Well, when, if you say to somebody, should, there, should children have rights? The answer will be, well, yes, of course. I mean, who could possibly be against the children's rights are surely things like applehood, you know, apple pie and motherhood, uh, uh, you know, in America. Who could, who except some Neanderthal could possibly <laughs> object to that? But the point, is, there's a very simple point here, which is this. If you and I as adults have rights, we exercise them or we choose to exercise them or we choose not to exercise them as the case may be. If children have rights, specifically children's rights, they're not in a position to exercise them and therefore they will have to be exercised by somebody on their behalf. And that person by and large is not going to be the parents. Well, why? Because if, if it was the parents who are going to exercise the rights, that's already the situation we're in. Parents already have that right and that responsibility to look after their children, okay? So if you institute something like children's rights, something specific, then the only other body, the only other group who are going to be in a position to exercise them on behalf of the children is the state. And therefore it's going to be a contest between the state and its, its emissaries and its functionaries against the parents uh, in respect of the welfare of their children. Now, let me make it clear that there are parents who are less than perfect in relation to their children. Um, and that's a, that has to be granted. And there are situations where children can even be in danger with certain parents, okay? And I have no objection, if you like, to, to anyone, in fact, not only the state, interfering in those situations. But the presumption has always got to be that the parents are right in what they're doing and it needs to be demonstrated clearly that there is a problem. In emergencies, you can maybe overlook some roughness, but by and large, you need, you need to let the parents get on with the job. The, as I was talking about earlier, but when, when talking about the um, COVID, by and large, the state doesn't have the knowledge that it requires in order to deal with these things in an appropriate way. And Generally speaking, I mean, we, we have history in the past in Ireland, and, and I suspect you have in Scotland as well, of children being taken from parents, right? Even, even parents whose attitude to them was less than perfect as were, and being cared for, with inverted commas, in, in a state surroundings, which history has shown hasn't always been that much better and has often been, in many cases, substantially worse than they were uh, than the those children were in their family milieu. So again here, um, what seems like, as I said, an obvious good, an uncontestable good, when you examine it, and you don't have to examine it even very closely, you begin to see that it's setting up, as it were, a contest, and in legally speaking, an unequal contest between the state and its functionaries on the one hand and parents on the others. The, the, the bulk of parents, most parents, know what's good for their children, want what's good for their children, or indeed go well beyond the, what, is, what is the minimum in order to provide for their children, and are the only ones, by and large, who can make the reasonable judgments as to what is best for their children. And society should be based on that principle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Barry, that's a good point. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. 
Um, I've got a book on my shelf here of Oxford University Press about human rights, and there's a chapter about children's rights. And within the text, it says that the, the big controversy with children's rights is it's not really giving rights to children. It's really giving rights to the state hmm. to make decisions or, or to influence the lives of children. That's what it's really all about. Yep. So it's there in you know the standard academic textbook. This is the point made. Yep. And yet in the Scottish Parliament, no hint at all that there could be any sort of controversy. So, so I'll explain this. I don't know if you've followed the situation in Scotland. So the Scottish government incorporated the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law, which was just virtue signaling. But then the UK government said, well, hang on, we're not sure that you're competent to do that as a devolved parliament. So it went to the Supreme Court. To be honest, I can't remember exactly what happened. But the only argument was that the SNP was saying, look, because we're in the union, we can't protect children's rights. <laughs> and you've got the Conservatives saying the SNP are just trying to, they're trying to use children's rights to generate grievance about the union. And that was all they could debate. There was not a single word about the actual impact of human rights. And, and I pointed out that what the bill says is that whatever's in the in the UNCRC is Scots law. And what, however the UN interprets it as well, in the past and in the future, can also be regarded as how it's going to be interpreted in Scotland. So, for example, the United Nations have said that in order to uphold children's rights, you have to have a smacking ban in your, mm. in your country. So Scotland has got a smacking ban. But the Conservative Party in Scotland almost all of them, they voted against the smacking ban, but then they voted for the incorporation of the, the UNCRC. <laughs> so they voted against it and they voted for it. Also, for the UNCRC, the United Nations have said, in order to uphold children's rights, you have to have hate speech legislation. Ah, yes. Um, so the Scottish Conservatives voted against, basically, hate speech legislation, but then they voted for a bill that's effectively applies, you have to have hate speech legislation. I mean, it's so frustrating watching from the sidelines thinking <laughs> just no one is no one is getting to grips with the real issues. Now, Barry says parental rights and responsibilities. That's a very interesting point, because in a document that the Scottish government published uh, a few years ago, they actually had the temerity to state that they thought that the concept of parental rights should be eliminated. Whoa. An existing law talked about parental rights and responsibility, but they said what we would propose is to just do away with the concept of parental rights and we'll just have parental responsibility. <laughs> now, now, I think that, that, that should be like front page of every newspaper. Oh, that, that should be a massive controversy. Um, people chaining themselves to railings all over the place. Mm -hmm. Massive issue. But in Scotland, I, I noticed it. I've talked about it. I drew people's attention to it, but it's just bizarre. That should be so controversial, shouldn't it? To eliminate the very concept of parental rights. That, and that, no, that's, that's actually staggering. But in one way, it's indicative of how far we've come that they can make this outrageous statement openly and feel safe and secure in so doing, and with good reason, that in that nobody seems to object to it. The idea... Oh. That the parents should, as it were, be responsible, the financially responsible for their children and providing, for the, you know, food and clothing for them and so on, but not have rights over those whom they are providing these things for, is so obviously bizarre uh, that it simply takes your breath away. The only yep. other thing is that is to provide rights without responsibilities, which is the, which is the flip side of the coin, which seemed to be what you would be giving children vis-a-vis -vis their their uh, supporters, as it were, and their guarantors in the state who don't have a personal responsibility here, by the way. Yeah. And they, yeah. they don't have a personal, they don't have a specific relationship with the child that a parents and only parents can have. Yeah. Okay? And I include, by the way, adoptive parents in this, yeah. those who actually built a relationship mm -hmm. of trust and love based on the child's welfare um, can have. Nobody, no civil servant, you know, living in another town or another city or miles away and seeing somebody for maybe 15 minutes a week, if that, can have the same uh -huh. relationship. It's just no. not going to work. And again, no. we can bring our cost-benefit analysis in here. 
And while you can always find some case, some really bizarre case, and say, as people will do, and say, look, isn't this terrible? If we had children's rights in law, this wouldn't happen. And the answer is, well, no, it would. And I'm sorry, it just doesn't work like that. Um, and there's an old principle in sociology which says, when you're comparing two states of affairs and two, two institutions, you always have to realize that the best of the worst is better than the worst of the best. Uh -huh. So, I mean, let's let's take uh, single parenthood as an example. This is just an example. Uh -huh. um, if, if you were to say, look, um, the the ideal situation for the for the for the procreation and upbringing of children is the two parent male female family in a loving relationship, stable, uh, preferably married and so on. Almost instantly, somebody will say, I know a single parent in Glasgow who is working like 49 hours every day in order to provide for her children. And her children are wonderful. Whereas these children who have in this middle-class household, who have these parents, both of whom are very rich, they're out, they're juvenile delinquents. And you go, mm -hmm. right, so what? <laughs> okay. yeah. We're not talking about, you can always find specific instances. You're talking about what by and large in, in, in the round is the best way to produce the uh, kind of children that you want, yeah. not specific uh, uh, instances. Yeah, well, I often find myself having that sort of debate with people. I, I think that's something that I would say is an education issue. A family party policy is to introduce critical thinking lessons throughout school, throughout all age ranges. So cut out all the political indoctrination and just have critical thinking lessons that are unrelated to any um, any contemporary issue and that's exactly what i mean the way i normally put it is you know uh, my uncle joe smoked 60 a day and got run over by a bus when he was 96 as though that's like the knockdown argument to the idea that smoking might be damaging to your health but it's, it's a simple piece of critical thinking rationality if you like and yeah. i think it can be taught just going back to children their relationship with parents what the scottish government does they go straight to the children in fact before i say that just to say, the actual content of children's rights have, have virtually no application at all in Scotland. Okay, you're not allowed to have child soldiers. I mean, are, are there many child soldiers in Scotland? Okay, the, the, the people have got to have health care and education. I mean, these things were, were achieved decades or centuries ago. Okay, they're just not relevant to them. But the government, through teachers, obviously, teachers who don't really understand what's going on, I think, you go to children, the message to children is, Look, the government says, the United Nations say, that your mum and dad have got to look after you properly. And they've got to feed you and clothe you and care for you and make sure you're happy. That's their job because the government says so. Okay, And if they're not doing their job, you come and tell us and we'll mm -hmm. sort them out. Now, the thing with that is it changes the situation of the thing. Oh, oh my mum and dad do these things for me. That's good of them. I owe them something in return. To instead thinking, right, they better be doing their job properly, because if they're not, I'm going to complain. <laughs> That's Cause, right. Because they have to do it. That's right. I'll and, call and the it really undermines the, uh, the proper family relationship. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we've had the grim example before us, if only we would pay attention to it, in, in the Soviet Union uh -huh. and in other totalitarian countries, where one of the aims, specific aims, was to destroy... The family and family bonds so that the indivi each individual would relate directly and and solely to the state the, the mm -hmm. state would be as it were the mother and father official relating to every single individual we would cut out all the intermediate institutions and the the you have to give the 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 communists uh the as it were um kudos for seeing that Intermediate institutions do act as a barrier to the intervention and the reach of the state. But that's exactly as it should be. Uh, because, I mean, in the classical conception of the state, the state wasn't primarily concerned with these things. Maybe it was, should have been a bit more concerned classically, but it wasn't. It was concerned with, you know, foreign policy and general and law and order generally. And that was its primarily its remit. What we've seen in the 20th century is the creeping extension of the state's interest in almost every area 
uh, so that it is now, as it were, all in all, it's responsible for your health, it's responsible for your food, it's responsible for obesity or lack of it, it's responsible for knife crime, it's responsible for everything in some way. And when it takes on all of these responsibilities, it takes away from the individuals their responsibility uh, to provide for themselves, for their children. But you're absolutely correct. The corrosive effect on the people, okay, so those who are promoting will say, well, what difference does it make if you're correct in saying that we already have all of these things. In other words, we have education, we have health care, and we have food and provision. Then even if the children's rights uh, provisions are otios in that sense that they have nothing to bite on, then surely that's, that's not a problem. And you're, what you've said is absolutely correct because what it does is it changes the nature of the relationship between the children and the parents. Okay, and, and so you have children thinking, oh, well, if I don't, if, I mean, for example, if do parents have an obligation to make their children happy? And if so, how is that to be measured or accounted for? For example, if a child doesn't get a bicycle uh, for its birthday uh, and is upset by this, is, is this now a kind of quasi-criminal activity on your part as a parent? I, I mean, you might think this is fantastic, but, you know, we've seen even well, more bizarre things happening. Well, let me tell you about what's going on in Scotland on that front. Um, it's now about three years ago. The Scottish government produced a document um, redefining child abuse. But the current definition is that abuse or neglect leading to psychological derangement or bodily injury or something. It's pretty serious stuff. So they said this needs redefining. And they drafted a redefinition. And it included things like make a child feel that their opinions are not being valued. <laughs> make a child... Uh, feel worthless, um, expose a child to anger. I mean, there were lots more as well. It was quite a while. I mean, they were absolutely, utterly ridiculous. I, mean, I, I think any any normal parent would fall foul of a fair number of them through the course of a normal week. I'm a child but, abuser. Yeah. That's yeah. so all I can say. On, 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 according to that criteria, what yeah. can I say? And once children know that, <clears throat> if they know, if your parents are not taking your opinion seriously, that's child abuse, boys and girls. So if ever you think you've been abused at home, come and see our child protection officer. And don't. And let's just remind you again what constitutes child abuse. So if they're, if they're not listening to your opinions, if they're not valuing your thoughts, or they're not respecting you, if they're you know, getting angry with you. Um, so you can see the way that that was going. Now, it, this is interesting. I'm not quite sure what's happened. This was about three years ago this documentation was produced. There was a consultation on it. Um, there was some criticism of it, and it never made the news or anything, but there was a bit of criticism of it in the consultation. But I, I made a video about it and slated it. It got quite a few thousand views. But it seems like the Scottish government's got cold feet over it. And they've decided that, you know, they really don't want to go there because they think it might blow up in their face. I, I suspect that's what's happening. Um, because it was quite a while before coronavirus struck. So it'd be interesting to see if they try and come back on that and try and push that forward anymore, then we're, we're going to just have a field day with that because it was absolutely laughable what they produced. But you can imagine the people producing it. They're, it's a very uniform mindset, and it's also a sort of soft, gentle, indulgent, uh, sort of counselling, therapeutic sort of approach to parenting. Um, that's a shoot that dominates the sort of education, social work, academia, and that's what flowed into those uh, redefinitions of child abuse. So it'll be fascinating to see if the government does come back to it, or whether or not they just feel yeah. that the flare up when they produce that document um, has scared them off a little bit. If it has scared them off, then I think that's partly the Scottish Family Party doing its job. Well, well uh, but if it comes if it comes back, then we're we're, we're ready to get to grips with it again. Okay. Right. Just, just to bring this, this in, um, how do we protect from the named person? Thought it was ruled unlawful, ripped my family apart, trespasses on my status, rights, and authority. Now, Gerald, I don't know if you followed the named person scheme saga. So I heard something that? about it some years ago. Yeah, I, it, it, that's my right. impression was that some there was going to be a designated person who was going to be responsible for specific children. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. So every child would have a named person <clears> and in the initial versions of it, basically there were two problems with it. One was it said basically the threshold for interfering in family life 
was instead of being abuse or neglect, it became a well-being concern. <laughs> and no, no one could define what well-being was, but it seemed to mean something like happy. So if someone's if someone's a bit unhappy about something, that's a well-being concern. So share the information between every agency you like, and that's the time for the state to step in and try and help solve the problem with that family. Now, aspects of the information sharing, they were struck down in the Supreme Court. So that <clears throat> did away with it as a law. But um, as you're quite rightly saying here, the schemes carried on in any case. There are still named persons in Scotland. Children still have a named person. And the spirit behind it is very definitely alive and well. And it's the same spirit that's behind the children's rights movement, which is why I say the children's rights. It's like named person mark two. It's a different means of getting to the same end, which is handing more and more responsibility to the state. Uh, so the, the situation you're talking about here, I mean, that sounds appalling. We obviously don't know the, the details, but we can, uh, we can understand how difficult that situation must be. It's interesting, as leader of the family party, it's not unusual for people to get in touch uh, that want to tell their story of how they've been treated by the authorities with regard to some family matter. Now, obviously, I, I am fully aware I'm only hearing one side of the story with these things. So it's difficult to, to form a complete judgment. But very often I'm left with the impression that something really has gone wrong here. And there has been an implication that in particular, that there's one way to bring up kids. And that's the way they talk about it at the university and in the social work department and in the teacher training colleges or whatever, and within the government. That's the way to bring up children. And if you wander away from that a little bit too much, then they want to come and do something about it. I just, I just had this wonderful image, Richard, that on, on, on a given day in Scotland, all parents would bring all their children to Edinburgh, to the Parliament House, and leave them there. And say, here, hey, you kids, you look after them. All right? Can you imagine, you know, yeah. 150,000 children suddenly <laughs> top down the yeah. say, you, okay, you want to look after them, you do it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> One thing I, I suggested once, because with the name person scheme, there was a, they were saying that a lot of them were like a head teacher or a health worker. Mm -hmm. whatever. And the question was, well, who's going to do it in the holidays? <laughs> head teachers are so, so I suggested maybe um maybe parents could volunteer to be trained for it so they could take the role on in the holidays. I, I said you could do it as a pilot project. If it went well, you could maybe think about rolling it out through the rest of the year as well. That's a very good idea, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea. Uh -huh. But with the name person scheme, uh, my frustration with it is that there, there was massive opposition to it uh, at the at the peak. Huge opposition. All, every party in the Scottish Parliament, apart from the SNP, was against it for one reason or another, or one aspect or another of it. And it got struck down in the Supreme Court. Great victory. But now it's completely off the agenda, even though it's basically carrying on. The, the, the spirit behind it, the philosophy, and a lot of the, the sort of actions behind it as well, it's just carrying on. Yeah. But it's gone off the public radar completely. But as I said at the beginning, I'll be I'll make a video about the Ben's Hoose idea. It would take too long to explain, but look out for the video coming out this week, all being well. And you'll see, again, this is another concern of the SNP government pushing in the direction of bringing children under its wing, treating children as, as their own rather than uh, belonging to, to parents. So keep an eye open for that. Right, that was a fascinating chat. And I'll there's one other issue I'd really like to touch on before we finish. We've only got five minutes left, and that is demography. Now, I think mm -hmm. it seems at the moment everyone is talking about demography. It was completely off the agenda, I would say, even only a few weeks ago. But now it seems to have just suddenly become a mainstream issue, concern about population decline. I mean, is that the case in the Republic of Ireland? Is, it, uh, is the issue coming up the agenda? Well, I, I try to stay away from the news outlets as much as possible so because it, it ruins my day. Uh, but uh, I, I can't say, I couldn't say that it has. Um, okay. But, you know, the, it, the, this has been an issue not for the last year, but for the last 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, uh -huh. the whole of Western Europe is falling off a demographic cliff. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
not helped by the fact that we we have uh, we've you know instituted an industry for killing our babies before they're even born, which is one way of dealing with children. That doesn't seem to constitute child abuse, however. So I say nothing wow. more about that. Uh, yeah, no, it's quite extraordinary. Um, so, yes. so if we could just chip in there, the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, the UN says that that means you have to have abortion available in your country. If you don't have abortion available, you're not upholding the rights of children. I see. So, I, I, anyway, continue. Yeah, continue. right. Yeah, again, once again, the uh, the uh, the glaring kind of stupidity of such a position uh -huh. is, is too uh, too obvious to comment on. Yeah. Anyway, demography. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what's the answer? Well, what, what are the concerns? Why do you think population decline is a concern? And what well, I mean, okay, first of all, I mean, we all know, we now live in the modern welfare state, which has taken responsibility for the provisions of all sorts of things, uh, including, you know, uh, pensions and support in old age, all of which seems fine, except that I'm sure most people think that somehow their 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 national insurance contributions or whatever you call them in, in, in the UK are going to some kind of fund, which is there. But of course, we all know it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, there is no there is no fund. All of this money is being is being paid from current income or sorry, uh, the current uh, tax receipts. And so what happened? I mean, well, let, let me give you the point in the in the United States, when social welfare was introduced, you had an you had a pyramid like this for every one person in receipt of social welfare. And it wasn't very much. There was something in the region of 15 to 20 people paying taxes. OK, so you get a, you get a triangle. And mm -hmm. over time, what's happened is the number of people on welfare and in receipt of benefits and the generosity of those benefits has increased at the same time as the base supporting it has shrunk so that it's, you know, it's moving towards one to one. And we're now in a situation where we're moving towards an inverted pyramid where we're going to have an ever shrinking number of people supporting an ever larger number of people on benefits. And you know what that is, Richard? That's a recipe for a social revolution. Eventually, uh -huh. those people in their 20s are going to say, I don't understand why 75% of my income is being taken from me when there's no guarantee that by the time I get to be 60 or 65, that any of this is going to be there for me. Mm -hmm. And now you have a problem. And that's where we're heading. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there have been people aware of the problem for a long time, but it seems in the media has come out. I mean, the Scottish government's produced a paper because Scotland's total fertility rate is something like 1.37, which is very, very low, far lower than the UK uh, in general. It's really disastrous. But one of the solutions they came up with was uh, providing fertility treatment just for single people. <laughs> All right. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, just where do you start? Oh, that's it, deliberately God. producing fatherless and motherless children. So rather than encouraging or mm -hmm. removing the barriers that prevent people from having as many children as they might yeah. otherwise have wanted, because or single, trying to change because, the color. Yeah. Because single people having children has been such a success. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's just bizarre. Isn't it? Again, mm -hmm. yet another thing that they, they whoever wrote that should have been thinking, this is going to be really controversial. This is going to backfire. People are going to be up in arms if I write this. But they don't need to think that. They can just yeah. write that yeah. and know that in Scotland, yeah. it, it's barely going to create a ripple in, in, in the mainstream media or, or in the political establishment. No well, one would dare it's, pick it's, up on it. It's the boiling frog phenomenon. I mean, the temperatures have been turned up over the years so often on so many issues that uh -huh. we've simply become accustomed to, let's use the phrase, the new normality in social yeah. matters. And yeah. therefore, those things which even 10, 15, 20 years ago would have caused a storm, now hardly cause a ripple. Yeah, yeah. Just going back to the uh, the, the benefits issue. I think many years ago, it was the case that money was paid into a pot and it was invested and then spent. But I think the interesting issue, mm -hmm. sort of moral issue, is are older generations to blame? Younger generations could say, well, look, older generations, they voted for parties that have said, this is what we're going to do. We're, we're not going to run this system in a responsible way. We're just going to make it so we we use income for it. Um, so all the generations have benefited from that through their life. And now um, that's going to have a negative effect on, on younger generations. But are older generations really responsible for that? 
were they aware of, of making that decision? Is that well, a relevant guess, thing? Gonna... I'm sorry, Richard, I beg, I beg your pardon. I, I, my guess is no. It's if, if I can just begin a sort of a brief anecdote. When I was a boy walking down the street of my hometown, Cork, and I passed the Munster and Leinster Bank, it said deposits of 20 million. And I had this image of there being 20 million pounds sitting in the basement of the bank. And of course, that wasn't the case. Mm. Right? So I just, and you know, if you ask, if, I would say if you took a poll of 100 people and asked them if they knew anything about fractional reserve banking, they wouldn't have the slightest idea. They think uh, that their money goes into the bank and is held there for them and so on. When you tell them it's not, they would be horrified. They wouldn't believe you anyway. They think you're making it up. And so I expect that the, ma the, the mass of people paying their social insurance contributions uh, didn't think anything more about it. And they simply assumed that somehow it was being, you know, it was being taken care of by the government and mm -hmm. uh, so on, and it would be doled out to them when they needed it. So you can't really blame them uh, too much any more than you can blame somebody for not knowing about the ins and outs of fractional reserve banking. But you can see why we are setting up a conflict, an intergenerational conflict, because it is going to be the case where we're increasingly the, the working young the shrinking the numbers of working young are going to be supporting a never number of non-working old people. And that's going to lead to resentment, whether mm -hmm. justified or not, and, mm -hmm. and so on. And by the way, that has other implications for other social policies, such as, for example, euthanasia. But maybe that's something for another night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we will save that for another night. There will be another night. Let's, let's just look at the kind of comments for you here to finish off. You've been a great and fascinating guest how well, about that thank you very right much there. you're very kind so, helen excellent chat so with what let's do thanks helen right time has gone gerald that's been great you must come on again we'll, we'll book you on again in uh in a few months time to talk about some other issues but uh yeah absolutely fascinating i, I often find on various issues I, I can read what different people say but it's when i end up speaking to or reading a philosopher but I finally think, ah, who's someone on my wavelength? Who's someone that's making sense to me? So I've definitely <laughs> had that experience. Somebody as confused as we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks for your comments. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. I'm a bit rusty. I'm just trying to remember how to do this. Like, let me get the, uh, the ad screen. So, right. Thanks, Gerard. Thank you, and Richard. Thanks, everyone.